One of the things I've done to try and hashtag make wrestling fun again in 2017 is do this retro review series because sometimes, frankly, if current professional wrestling isn't entertaining us, why not look to the past? I've had fun doing this series so far, even though primarily it's only been bad shows that have been suggested, uh, but that could be fun too sometimes. There's no question. So if you have an idea for an old pay-per-view, an old Raw, SmackDown, Nitro, Thunder, um, a DVD set, whatever the case might be, if it's something wrestling related from the past and you want me to review it, then what I want you to do is suggest it in the comment section below. If somebody's already suggested what you want to see done next, then thumbs up that comment. I'll pick from a few of those and then you can go to Twitter or Facebook and the OTR Central pages and vote there when the poll is posted. But anyways, the winner this time around was ECW One Night Stand 2005. The date, June 12th, 2005. It had been over four years since the last ECW show. And I think in part as a response to the success of the Rise and Fall of ECW DVD set, combined with Vince McMahon understanding that he owned the ECW name, the likenesses, the brand, all of that property, all that video library, why not try to maximize the return on that investment? Also knowing that you have the old owner of ECW, Paul Heyman, in the house, along with a lot of former ECW talent on the roster, it made sense to try and do basically what amounted to a pilot to see if WWE could do something with this name, with this brand in the future. Why sit on it? Especially knowing you have a segment of the fan base that was very loyal to ECW, very passionate about ECW to this day. And it reflected in the financial success of this pay-per-view. You're talking about 325,000 pay-per-view buys, which going back to the old days of the WWE pay-per-view model, WrestleMania was head and shoulders number one, Royal Rumble was head and shoulders number two, and usually 325,000 buys was right around what SummerSlam averaged. And this was your big show of the summer, one of your big four. So not only did ECW One Night Stand 2005, in terms of buy rates, hold its own as a filler pay-per-view, it held its own against big four pay-per-views like Survivor or SummerSlam and kicked the tail out of uh, Survivor Series. And you had enough interest where, if I remember correctly, the website shut down due to people trying to order it and not enough bandwidth on the site to be able to support it. So all around... This was viewed as a successful show, and understandably so. But as I went back and watched it, I was really 50-50. There were plenty of things I liked, and honestly, there was a lot that I didn't like. It was a fun show to a certain degree, kind of that trip down memory lane, and sometimes nostalgia can carry the day, and to a degree, that's what happened here. Because in terms of a pure wrestling show, this was not a great wrestling show. This most certainly was not a great wrestling pay-per-view by no stretch of the imagination. It wasn't even necessarily a great ECW style type of pay-per-view, but it was good enough and successful enough to where the One Night Stand was redone again in 2006 and then they dropped the ECW from it in 2007, did it a couple more years before it eventually evolved into Extreme Rules. You know, ultimately the company decided to do their WWE ECW crap, which we won't even talk about. But it all really kind of started right here. And it was almost kind of like a repayment for all the crap of the invasion angle. One small part. Just one small part. But an important part nonetheless. Now I'm not going to go match by match through this card. Because honestly, like I said, the matches really weren't that much to write home about. I'm going to talk about what I liked and what I didn't like. Here's what I liked. I liked the adult, testosterone-driven, gritty feel of this show the passionate crowd, and how engaged and into it they were throughout the course of the night. I mean, when you see something like this and you're sitting at home, this is the type of crowd that is an adult male fan like myself. I look at that and say, I would want to be a part of that. That seems like a whole different type of wrestling viewership experience. And I always have liked the optics of the Hammerstein Ballroom. You know, there was historical reasons for having the event there since you weren't going to do it at the old ECW uh, arena, the bingo hall, if you will. Uh, but I always thought for 
a smaller type of show, and not to say this was small potatoes or anything, because it most certainly wasn't. It did 325,000 pay-per-view buys. It most certainly was not small potatoes. Ultimately, when you look at it, the show just has a cool feel to it, a small type of intimate setting, but you have plenty of people there. The place is noisy and all of this, just a real gritty type of feel. And even though generally you like to have storylines going into a show and build a show like this around storylines, I actually like the fact that we didn't overdo it and have a bunch of silly storylines or a bunch of useless storylines because they weren't needed. This was a nostalgia night. And based off of some of the matches you had throughout the course of the night, there was enough natural storytelling there and enough story there with enough characters there that you didn't need storylines of this guy does this to this guy, so then he gets them back and then we see what happens at the pay-per-view, that type of thing. It wasn't needed, it wasn't necessary. Sometimes it isn't, and you just don't need to do it. And in this particular case, it wasn't needed, so why do it? And being an ECW-type show, one of my fears back in 2005 was whether or not they were going to make it a WWE version of ECW or were they going to try and make it as ECW-like as they possibly could? And I thought in general they did a pretty good job of actually trying to make it feel like an ECW show with much better production values, mind you. I thought in general they stayed pretty true to the brand of ECW as much as a WWE funded and run show was going to. I enjoyed Joey Styles and Mick Foley on commentary, even though it may have been a little bit better going back in the old days of how things were done to have Joey Styles do the commentary solo. I thought him and Mick Foley made some sense, and I thought they were okay together. Much better than any wrestling commentary we largely get. Uh, the matches weren't too long because, let's be honest, with a lot of these guys and the venue that you were in, you didn't want to have the longest matches. In several of these matches, you were going to do so much brutal shit that you couldn't really go a long time, especially with some of the other crap, mind you, that they uh, crammed in here. But the matches weren't too long. I really liked and appreciated Jericho putting Storm over in the opener. Um, you know, it's one of those things he didn't have to do it. And you'd look at it from a WWE standpoint, why would you do it? Because Jericho's going to stay, Storm isn't going to be there. But he did it, and it was a good way to kick off the show. It was also cool to see so many of the guys that made ECW ultimately what it was. From Sandman, Tommy Dreamer, Sabu, RVD, Taz, you know, even the guys like the Mikey Whipwreck, of the World. I mean, so many of these pillars throughout the years, Paul Heyman obviously as well, the pillars, the bedrocks, the foundation of ECW. You got to see so many of them. Not every single one, uh, but the vast majority of them. And I even enjoyed the overbooked main event because it felt like an ECW tag team title match main event. Even though it wasn't for any tag team titles or anything, it actually felt like an ECW main event from back in the day. And that I appreciated. Even though if I saw this type of match now, for the most part, I would crap all over and talk about how overbooked it was and how silly and stupid this crap was and how they did way too much in way too little time. The fact is, for ECW, what this show was supposed to be about, who it was representing, it made all the sense in the world. Now, on the flip side, like I said, there's plenty that I didn't like. First of all, none of the matches were all that particularly good or noteworthy, honestly. Uh, in particular, Rey Mysterio versus Psychosis and Benoit versus Guerrero were incredibly disappointing. You know, Psychosis Mysterio barely went six minutes. Benoit and Guerrero was one of the longest shows of the night, in it, or matches of the night, and it got ten. You had Benoit and Guerrero, and they barely went 10 minutes. That match could have used more time and probably should have had more time. Uh, all the matches, frankly, though, were on the short side, and that's because of some of the other crap that happened throughout the night. Uh, like I said earlier, while I like that the matches weren't too long, you could have used a couple of slightly longer matches to, I think, improve the flow of the show. Uh, I also didn't like kind of the reminder of how often these guys did stupid shit and Noel sold a lot of it uh, to really get themselves over. Now, granted, in the mid to late 90s, very early 2000s, this was so unique and so different and so cutting edge and revolutionary in terms of professional wrestling, it worked for them. But the problem was you got to a point in time 
where you feel like other than guys starting to die at random points in time in matches, you had seen just about everything that could be done. And product that was really always built off of the premise of can you top this at some point in time, you would pop the territory, so to speak, and you could no longer top it. And that was kind of how this show was. You had weapons in the opening match, you had weapons in the main event, and the majority of the matches had some type of crazy, ridiculous shit going on. And you just don't need that on pretty much every match on the card. It also served as a reminder for all the guys who were dead that were a part of ECW. You know, going to the opening match with the Candido chant, who had just, I believe, very uh, recently passed away before the show. But you got the video package of reminding you who had died. Um, Then you think about some of the guys that were on this show that are no longer with us. Benoit, no longer with us. Eddie Guerrero... Um, didn't last but a few months longer before he passed away. Mike Awesome eventually killed himself a year and a half or so after this event. Axel Rotten, Balls Mahoney died within a very short period of time of each other back in 2016. It's kind of depressing when you go back and watch this and you see that so many of these guys are dead. And this was only 12 years ago. So these are not guys dying in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. These are guys dying in their 30s, their 40s, and their 50s, and it's very sad. Then when I think of ECW and some of the guys that really helped make ECW what it was, you had no Raven and no Terry Funk. Sure, you got video packages and highlight packages that reminded you of those guys and those con- their contributions, but you didn't get Raven, you didn't get Terry Funk, and it felt like, even with all the crazy crap that you had, how could you really call it an ECW show if one or both of those guys wasn't there? And ultimately, I think the one thing that really bothered me, like in terms of a big deal bothered me going back and watching it again, was all this WWE invasion crap with Raw and Bischoff and Edge and his crew uh, and then SmackDown with um, JBL and Kurt Angle and those guys. It was like Vince McMahon just was determined to put his own foot hold on this show, to put his own stamp on this show. He just couldn't trust that Paul Heyman and ECW could have their own one-off show and have it be successful. We just had to do this dumb crap. And even the build-up to this event, it was not building up the ECW guys against other ECW guys as much as it was the Raw and SmackDown guys are going to be there at ECW One Night Stand, and we're trying to relaunch a little mini-invasion angle four years after the first one was an epic fucking flop and failure. And you devoted so much time to the SmackDown guys and having JBL cut a promo, the Raw guys and Bischoff cutting a promo, Paul Raw RV, RVD, excuse me, coming out and cutting a promo on these guys, Paul Heyman coming out and cutting a promo on these guys. It was just way too much talking for a wrestling show. And it was way too much. And ultimately, to me, it just wasn't needed. It wasn't. Because even after the main event was over, we still had another 15 minutes of show that was still ultimately about ECW versus WWE. That wasn't what this night should have been about. That wasn't what this night was supposed to be about. It was just unnecessary bullshit. As about unnecessary as JBL, as they're doing this fight between WWE and ECW guys, sitting there and hard weighing the blue meanie. I don't care what type of heat there was. I don't care what type of history there was. There was absolutely no excuse when everybody else is doing business and working that you're fucking shooting on a guy and intentionally try to bust him the fuck open. And even the way the whole setup to this big showdown and fight happened, I get that Stone Cold Steve Austin had ECW ties and was there for ECW for basically a brief cup of coffee. But when you look at it, it still ultimately had to be that Austin was the one to be the real main event. Austin was the one that we built it around. The, you know, the way you brought in Taz was pretty cool. The fight was kind of cool. But it was one of those things that was, again, just kind of aggravating. It was like Vince McMahon and the WWE just couldn't help themselves. They took up a quarter of the show or more with WWE versus ECW crap. And to me, it didn't help the show. I thought it hurt the show quite a bit. You could have had a couple of more matches. A couple of the matches, especially Mysterio Psychosis and Benoit versus Guerrero, could have definitely used more time. Um, While it was cool to see guys like JBL and Angle 
and Edge, and in particular Eric Bischoff, embrace the heat and own the heat and not try to be cool, try to be hated. I love when guys do that, and those guys embrace their role on this night. It wasn't like the next year where John Cena's acting like a pouty little bitch because how dare they boo me when you should know what you're doing when you fucking go into it. For one night, act like the villain. For one night, be the hated son of a bitch. It just... I thought I was actually going to go back and watch this show and enjoy it a little bit more than I did. It wasn't terrible like some of these other shows that I've already reviewed. But honestly, while it was a financial success for the company and led them to do more things with the ECW name, um, and that was a positive, and it had some definite moments because of the nostalgia where it was fun, and I won't say it wasn't totally fun because there were definitely elements and moments that were very, very fun to watch. Just the way it was packaged and presented ultimately and how much they shoehorned in the WWE and this stupid invasion crap really ruined this show for me. It should have been a whole lot more than it actually was and you have Vince McMahon to thank for that.